Hello everybody, welcome to the channel. My name is Mark. Today we'll be talking about my bookshelf and uh, the books that I buy, why I buy them, what I'm into uh, when it comes to books. And so that's what you'll be learning about me today. So to give you a little background about my reading habits, what I read, uh, what are defined as classics, that's predominantly what I, what I go for. Uh, I like to read nonfiction and uh, some contemporary novels, but for the most part, I, I, you know, sort of stay in the past in regards to my reading. So I got a lot of books here, really excited to talk about them. Um, I'm not going to like talk about each single one in depth or anything like that. I'll probably talk about ones that either mean a lot to me or uh, I have an interesting, you know, experience when I went to go, you know, buy them or find them. And so the way I'm going to structure this video is I'm going to talk about why I read the classics. Um, then I'm going to sort of hopefully encourage you to like read the classics um, or, you know, try out a few classic works and just see what you think. Um, and so then I'm going to talk about uh, my book buying habits, you know, what I go for, what I, where I'm looking for these, these books. And uh, yeah, let's, let's do this. So... Why do I read the classics? Well, I think what really gets me excited when it comes to reading is reading what has influenced a lot of people. Uh, I do the same thing when it comes to movies. I love movies, and I, I like to watch, you know, you know, whatever's on like the top ten list, top one hundred lists, or like, you know, what are Martin Scorsese's top ten movies, his personal favorites, like what has influenced him. So I like to know what influences people, and you know, when you think of like most influential works, you think of like, I guess like Shakespeare, when it, when it comes to books like Shakespeare and uh, Plato and uh, Cervantes and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, you know, I could just, you know, stand here for like an hour and just list names. But um, that's what gets me excited, just knowing what influences people and what, what did they get out of this book or this movie or, or what have you. And so it sort of uh, elevates my reading experience when not only am I enjoying the story, but I'm also trying to pick up on themes that, you know, has influenced other authors that I like and, you know, seeing any uh, comparisons between that author's work and the book I'm currently reading or same goes for movies. Is there any shots in this movie that look like a Scorsese movie or, you know, uh, a Christopher Nolan movie or Ingmar Bergman movie? And so, um, so that's what gets me excited. That's why I read the classics. And I don't only read the classics. I, I like to stay in the modern day, read some nonfiction, but this is predominantly what I do uh, in, my, in my reading. I think, uh, well, I should probably say that when I was in high school, uh, I hated reading. I spark noted everything. Uh, I was forced to read The Great Gatsby, Frankenstein, Shakespeare, and I resented all of it. I, just wasn't into it. I'm sure this is an experience that a lot of people had uh, with their English classes in high school. And I want to sort of uh, bring people back to the classics because I was able to come back and find a lot of value in them. And I think it's a great experience that, you know, uh, I want to share with everyone uh, because it's very exciting. It gets me really excited to talk about this. And um, so what changed in my mind? What was the turning point where I went from I hate reading and I hate classics and I don't want to do anything have anything to do with them and to like completely loving them and like devoting like you know 70% of my spare time to reading these books um, it just took one book for me to change my mind and I actually a year ago on a whim I decided to read Frankenstein again I had as I said spark noted it in high school retained none of it I was just memorizing it for a quiz um, and so I totally forgot about the story. So I read it a year, about a year ago, and I got like hooked in. Mary Shelley's writing just t totally consumed me from the first chapter. And I sat there for an entire day and I read the whole story. And it was just, it blew my mind because, you know, for one thing, I think we also have this idea of Frankenstein as being this like green monster with bolts in his neck. He's going like this. He's like, oh. And, um, you know, just, you know, from those movies in the 40s and the 50s, you know, that are sort of ingrained in pop culture. And, you know, that's what we associate with Frankenstein. The book Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, totally different, totally different. 
Um, I'm sure many of you have read it, um, but maybe you have the same experiences as, as me where you're like, you know, whoa, this story is completely different where the monster is actually a very complex character and you, you get to, you know, dive into the mind of uh, Frankenstein's monster and see things through his eyes. And it just blew my mind in every sense of the word. And so it sent me on this path of like, hey, the classics can be pretty good. I should probably check out some more. And so it sent me down this path where here I am standing, a, a, you know, a year later looking at like, I, have, I don't know, I just have this, uh, whenever I'm in a thrift store, I'm like, you know, I have to like buy at least five classics. It's, it's kind of a problem. I discovered this book this past year called the Penguin Classics book, uh, published by Penguin Random House. And it covers the history of uh, Penguin Classics from like the 40s and the 50s to the modern day and the different covers and the different titles in their collection. And it is this is an absolute treasure trove because for me, this book introduced me to a lot of classics that I didn't know exist, like a lot of weird and obscure books that are defined as classics that I, that I had never heard before. And it got me like really excited. I'm like, what else is out there? And it's, you know, sent me on this wild goose chase for, you know, rare, obscure books, you know, that are under the title as classic that have influenced a lot of people, but, you know, isn't exactly talked a lot about today. And so this book covers different areas of the world, different cultures, and like the great works that, you know, came out of those cultures and time periods. And it's just unbelievable. And so what I would like to encourage you is is to maybe check this book out or, you know, just like look up uh, classic book lists online because you can charter your own path into the classics. Your, your shelf could be all classics and look nothing like mine. And so that's the sort of message I want to, I want to put out is the, the old, you know, old books are worth checking out that are defined as classics. And, you know, there are certain books that, you know, some people feel, you know, you should feel obligated to read like Homer's Iliad. Like that's like one of the defining, you know, the starting points of literature. Like that's a book that is sort of like a must have, but, um, there's just, you know, you can, you can see all these different cultures and, uh, time periods throughout human history. And you can just read these great books that came out of them. And it's just an unparalleled experience. And I, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. And I want to just get people motivated about it because I've had an absolute blast reading these books. I haven't read all of them. Obviously I'm not, you know, a maniac, but, um, it is just, it is such a joy to, you know, like if you want to like do like, I guess it's called a dopamine detox now where you don't want to be on your phone. I encourage you just just check out a classic book. You'll you'll have you'll you could surprise yourself with how much uh, fun you can have, and so yeah, I, I've talked long enough. You get the point. So my book buying habits, what are they? So when it comes, to, the good thing about being into the classics is they've been printed over and over again, and so they're like dirt cheap. And, you know, they're everywhere. And so you don't really have to spend too much money. It's not really an expensive hobby. So that's the good good part. And so my principle now is, well, I've stopped buying books because I have way too much to go through. I've read a, a, lot, a lot of these, but I haven't gone through all of them. And so, um, but I don't spend more than $5. And also the more dilapidated and like uh, ripped up the cover is and, you know, worn out, the more I want it, uh, because uh, unless it has mold, I don't want any moldy books, obviously. But um, I think the part that adds to the experience of reading a classic is, you know, reading like a book that's been beat up and has like, you know, the pillow, the the pages are like almost like yellowed. Like it enhances the reading experience because you feel like you're reading this old book because it's about an old story. So it's like, I don't know, it's I guess it's an aesthetic thing, I guess, but like generally like i go for like older publications of these these books cuz i feel like it adds to the experience of reading a classic like it's like i'm wiping off the dust of a treasure chest and like opening it up and um like the insides are rubies and diamonds and gold and whatever um but the outside the chest itself is you know grimy and covered in you know dust and what have you but the insides are st still extremely valuable 
weird analogy, but I hope that makes sense. So I'm just going to start, uh, you know, knocking my way through this. So let's see. So you can't really start a classics bookshelf tour without talking about Homer's Iliad. Um, so, okay, well, for the sake of time, I'm not going to talk too much, but Homer's Iliad. Early Greek philosophy. Um, haven't read this yet. I've read uh, the first part of Bertrand Russell's The History of Western Philosophy, where it covers the ancient uh, era of philosophy, where I think this book talks about Pythagoras, Democritus, um, Thales, uh, you know, the, the pre-Socratic philosophers. Prometheus Bound, The Supplements, Seven Against Thebes, The Persians by Aeschylus. Uh, and the reason I got this was because of Prometheus Bound. I wanted to read the play. That's the main selling point. I haven't read the other ones yet. So Sophocles, The Theban Plays. I have two copies of The Histories by Herodotus. Um, why do I have two copies? I, I don't know. They were both thrifted. So there you go. The Last Days of Socrates by Plato. This was an important book to me because this is the book that sort of changed my mind on philosophy. I always thought that it was like, oh, philosophy's you know stupid or something. Uh, some dumb opinion that I had. I read this because I, I think I just found it in my house. And I was like, I had nothing else to read. And I was like, okay, I'll just check this out, see what's up. And totally changed the way I look at philosophy and sort of really was my uh, entry point into the, the field of philosophy. And um, it introduced me to like the art of rhetoric and argument and, you know, just Socrates uh, arguing with people, which is just always fun to listen to or read. And um, so, yeah, I think that this is a great book to read. I would recommend this to a lot of people. Uh, anyone who's sort of interested in, you know, antiquity or philosophy in general. Uh, if you're into philosophy, you've already probably read this. But uh, this is a great book. Definitely recommend. So, some more Plato. Uh, Republic. That's an, essential, that's an essential book to have. The Symposium. Aristotle's Politics. Um, I got this book because I, I'm really into politics. Or there was a well, not so much as I was before, but there was a time period where I was really into politics, and so um, I was like, okay, I need to be a well-rounded, you know, when it comes to politics and political discussion, I need to have like a good foundation, you know, uh, I need to know what I'm talking about if I want to have good political discussions. So I was like, I gotta go, I gotta start from the beginning. I gotta go. What's the first, you know, political text? And it's, I believe it's this book. Um, Aristotle's politics. Um, and so I've read sections of this, the parts where he's arguing for different forms of uh, governments. And so I haven't read it in full yet, but we'll get there. Poetics and Rhetoric by Aristotle. This is uh, this collection is from Barnes and Noble. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think this is the only collection I could find of both po poetics and rhetoric together. I mostly bought it for rhetoric, but... Um, making my way through this. So we're still in antiquity here. Um, still with the, you know, big boys. Uh, Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics. Diogenes, the Cynic, Sayings and Anecdotes, uh, published by Oxford World Classics. Um, I've read a lot of this. Uh, Diogenes is quite the character. So now we're sort of getting into the Roman Empire. Um, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. I read this earlier this year. Uh, I mean, it's what an invaluable book. I mean, you're you're peering into the mind of a Roman emperor. Isn't that? I mean, that's just weird. I'm re, I'm like I just can't believe I'm reading something that a Roman emperor wrote. Kind of blows my mind. Um, I got to read the Conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar to stay it, stick with that trend of Roman emperors. But anyway, um, great read. Stoicism is not the philosophy I'm into, for sure. Twelve Caesars, The Twelve Caesars by Suetonius. I have not read this yet. Thrifted it for like three bucks. So that was pretty cool. So we got Seneca, Dialogues and Essays. Seneca was the tutor to Nero, I believe. The Emperor Nero. Um, I'm ashamed to say I haven't read this yet. 
but I am looking forward to reading it. So here's a good example of uh, what I like to go for when I when I thrift books. Um, so we have this here, Roman Poets of the Early Empire. Um, this is a collection uh, of poetry, uh, selections from uh, Ovid, Ovid, I don't really know the, the correct pronunciation. He wrote the Metamorphosis. Um, and so we got Seneca as well. Uh, let's see. Oops. ASMR. Book turning. Page turning. Um, yeah, this is, this is just a collection of, 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 you know, poetry, selections of it. And this is out of print. Um, this, I, in that Penguin Classics book that I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, they have a section of the book uh, called the vault or the vaults, I believe, and it's where it they keep all like the uh, out of print titles that you know they weren't selling well enough or what have you, and so Penguin Classics stopped uh, publishing them, and I was able to pick this up, um, I think off thriftbooks.com. I sp I I love thriftbooks.com. Holy crap! Anyway, uh, this one I go for. I really like the out-of-print Pe Penguin Classics. I think this was printed in the 90s or something. Um, but this is a good example of what I like to go for. The Metamorphoses by Ovid. Uh, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Ovid, Ovid, somebody correct me. Uh, this is a prose translation. So the original was written in, in verse, I want to say. I mean, it was a, it's, a, it's a poem. Uh, but this, this right here is a prose translation. Um, I haven't read this yet. I feel, I'm a little intimidated by it. I thrifted it for like, you know, two bucks or something like that. So I'm looking forward to reading this. Gonna, you know, gonna hype myself up before I do. So I have one book from the era of classic, cl uh, Catholic philosophy. So, you know, right after uh, the fall of the Roman Emperor, Empire, um, I believe. So we got St. Augustine, Confessions. Um, haven't read this. I thrifted it. That tends to happen when I go to thrift stores. I just, you know, get a lot of classics and then, you know, sort of sit on my shelf for a bit until I get, get around to them. But uh, definitely looking forward to reading this. So we got Beowulf. That's a that's a must-have. Uh, I read this in high school. I, I remember this being like the one thing that I, I liked from reading in high school. This and Grendel. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, A24 is actually adapting this. Uh, uh, they're making a new movie of, of this story. And I think it comes out in July. Really looking forward to that. This is a book that I am so excited to have. Uh, the Quest of the Holy Grail. Written by, I believe, an anonymous author. We don't know who wrote this. Uh, the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. I am not brave enough for this yet. So we got the portable Machiavelli. This has The Prince. Probably his most famous work. Uh, the Discourses on Livy. I think the first ten books of Livy. Where he analyzes these books... Uh, these history books on the Roman Republic by the Roman historian Livy, and he sort of analyzes their political structure. And uh, I can't say I have I, ha I haven't read the discourses yet. I have read the Prince twice. Um, and then there's in here is uh, the Art of War by Machiavelli, as well as I think uh, some sh I think he wrote one work of fiction, a tiny work of fiction that's in here as well. Um, but saw this in a thrift store and I just had to have it. Um, so yeah. I actually missed a book here. We're going to go back in time a, a, a few hundred years. Uh, another example of what the, the books that I go for, uh, the weird stuff. This is called The Cloud of Unknowing, uh, as well as some other works. And we don't know who wrote this. Um, so I'll read you the back here. Um, so it was written during the, well, it was written during the age of European mysticism. Um, you know, we haven't exactly entered the Renaissance quite yet. So it's sort of the Dark Ages. And so... The main theme of this book is that God cannot be reached by human intellect, but only by a love that can pierce the quote unquote cloud of the unknowing. Um, I did not pick this book up for religious reasons or anything like that. I just wanted to read it because let's, you know, let's peer into the mind of someone who lived in, you know, the 12th century and see what they thought and what were their ideas of the world and religion. You know, that's, you know, again, that's what really interests me. On the topic of, you know, having resentment towards classics and, uh, you know, English class in high school and like having to read Shakespeare and uh, The Great Gatsby and just hating it, you know, that's something I definitely went through. Uh, I really did not like Shakespeare. 
Um, really did not like him. And it even took me a, a long time, even being into the classics, before I even harbored the idea of considering reading Shakespeare. And, but my mind has totally changed on Shakespeare. Um, one of the, what convinced me was I have a copy of the Norton Anthology of English Literature. And I'd, hear, I'd heard about this guy, Dr. Samuel Johnson. Um, I think he is probably more famous today for that meme picture. I'll put it up right now. That meme picture of him where he's like holding the book and he's looking confused, you know. And um, at least that's how I knew him. But turns out he was probably one of the greatest literary critics who ever lived and he wrote the dictionary or like the first iteration of the English dictionary. Um, so I have his collected works here and... Samuel Johnson, in, I don't know what year it was, it was sometime in the 1700s, he wrote a preface to a collection of Shakespeare plays and sonnets. And I read this, this preface um, about Shakespeare, because I wasn't brave enough to read Shakespeare, but I wanted to read about him, because, you know, oh, why does everybody cherish him so much? My idea of Shakespeare has completely changed. So in, in Samuel Johnson's preface, he talks about Shakespeare and his genius and his invention of the distincts, his, how his characters are so different and so human. And I was just reading the preface and I was like, holy crap, I got to read Shakespeare. I got to read, you know, I, I got to experience this. I can't believe I've been missing out. Um, and so my, me going from hating Shakespeare to like being curious to like absolutely loving him, uh, to get to that final stage of loving Shakespeare, I read I reread Hamlet. I read it in high school. High school, I probably spark noted half of it. Let's be honest here. Um, and high school, everything went over my head. I read it again. It blew my mind. Blew my mind. I mean, you know, hot take here. Hamlet's pretty good. Um, but I, I get it. Shakespeare's the go, the greatest of all time. I mean, there's no other way of putting it. His, his writing is. I mean, he was, he mastered the English prose or English, you know, uh, anything written in English, Shakespeare was the top dog. Um, and then I read some, uh, you know, some of, some of Harold Bloom and his ideas of Shakespeare, or, you know, his works, sorry, his uh, comments and not criticisms, but commentary on, on Shakespeare. And so I'm big into Shakespeare now, <laughs> basically. So anyway, let's get into this. Introducing, introducing Shakespeare. This is a book by, or it's a Pelican original. So this was a division of Penguin Classics up until like this, it was between like the, up from the 40s to the 70s. They were a division of Penguin Random House and then they merged with Penguin Classics in like the 80s. And so Pelican Classics covered nonfiction, you know, great works of nonfiction. And these, this book was printed in like 1972, this copy I'm holding here. So I'm really lucky to have a copy that's in good condition. And this, what this book is, is it sort of sets the stage in context, sets the stage, pun intended, I guess, uh, of uh, Shakespeare's time and era, his theater, uh, you know, the other playwrights at the time, like Christopher Marlowe and Ben Jonson. And it's sort of like a, you know, it's a prep book before you get into Shakespeare. You need, you need the context going in. Um, so very interesting book. Um, there it is again. Got this off thriftbooks.com. I cannot recommend them enough. So, okay, let's just blow through these fast because I got a lot of these. So, The Portable Shakespeare, another division of... The Viking Portable Library was a division of Penguin uh, Penguin Classics, and then they merged in like the 70s or 80s or, so, or something like that. I, I don't know if I have the history right. Um, but this has Hamlet, uh, Macbeth, Juli Julius Caesar, Romeo and Juliet, The Tempest, As You Like It, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. And then as well as the sonnets and uh, some excerpts from like the, the history plays like Henry the fourth and fifth. Um, and this is what I, this is what I'm reading right now. King Lear, the three Roman plays by Shakespeare and then four comedies by Shakespeare. Okay. So now uh, we're still in the 1600s. Don Quixote. Um, I read this earlier this year. This book made me laugh so hard I cried, probably on like maybe nine or ten occasions. I mean, I cannot praise this, <clears throat> praise this book enough. Uh, it's considered to be the first novel, like the first modern novel. Um, it is voted the greatest book of all time by the Nobel, Nobel Inst Institute. 
so that's really saying something here. Um, can't recommend this enough. I really, I just cannot. This is actually the second classic I read after Frankenstein. So I'm from Frankenstein to this, and that was kind of a big leap for me because um, there's a lot of this that went over my head. But hilarious, tragic. It's just the, this, the, the entire range of human emotions uh, can be experienced through this book. All right, well, we got another big one here. Uh, Paradise Lost, John Milton. Uh, this is a big one. Sort of getting back in the territory of uh, philosophy. We have The Critique of Pure Reason by Kant. Um, I've tried to read this. And it's like I'm trying to read Latin. It is, it's going to take me a long time to break into this thing because, boy, oh, boy, uh, what was he on about? I'm not a philosophy major, by the way. I'm a, me I'm a mechanical engineering major, so uh, I don't have any teachers to help me. Uh, I trying to go on, try to go in, trying to go into this thing, you know, solo was uh, not the smartest thing to do. Plus, I think you need like the context of his other works to even begin to understand what he's going on about in this book. So, yeah. Now we're entering France. We got of the social contact, <laughs> of the social contract, and other political writings by Rousseau. Um, I have read The Social Contract. I read it a few years ago. Um, I haven't read his other political writings, so that's why I have this. Got to get into those other writings. Um, but uh, I'm sort of fascinated with uh, pre-Revolution France, the Reign of Terror, and then, you know, into the Napoleonic Wars. That era of history absolutely fascinates me. So this is an essential part of, essential, you know, addition to my bookshelf. The Red and the Black by Stendhal. The Charter House of Parma by Stendhal. I, I guess you could define this as a classic. I mean, it's in the Barnes & Noble uh, Library of Essential Reading. So we'll, 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 for this video, we'll define it as a classic. Napoleon's Art of, well, Napoleon's Art of War. Um, this is a set of military maxims that Napoleon wrote when he was on Mount St. Helena. Um, so after, this is during his second exile, I believe. It was not his first exile when he wrote this. But... Um, but yeah, this is a short read, just maxims, you know, how to fight war. Um, it's interesting. The uh, the military dispatches of the Duke of Wellington. I guess this can be considered a classic. It's not any classic series except for maybe Oxford World Classics, but we got Barry Lyndon here. Now, Barry Lyndon is one of my favorite films ever, at least one of the most, the most beautiful films I've ever seen, but, uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick. It came out in 1975. And I watched the film, and I loved it. And I didn't know there was a book. And then I was in a used bookstore and I saw this. I saw Barry Lyndon sitting in a shelf. And that just about knocked the wind out of me too because I was like, there's a book on this? And it turns out it's written by William Makepeace Thackeray. And uh, he is most known for Vanity Fair. Probably his most famous book. Um, it would be his most famous book, I believe. Yeah. Um, and so... Shame to say I haven't read either of them, but I do own them, and they are in my... They're down the reading pipeline for me. On War. Um, this is an abridged version of the book, and it's sort of this analysis on warfare. And I think the, the famous line from this is, um, war is just an extension of politics. It, war achieves what, uh, what politics cannot. I think that's one of the famous lines from this. Um, so... Very interesting read. I haven't read all of it, but I've read uh, s s different portions of this book. So we got Victor Hugo, The Last Day of a Condemned Man, and other prison writings. We have selected poems of Victor Hugo. I don't think this is in print anymore. So we got Notre Dame of Paris. And there's my, uh, my very American pronunciation of the story because I'm too embarrassed to say it in French. Um, and... Is probably more well known as the Hunchback of Notre Dame for uh, American readers, um, but this is the original title in France. Two uh, copies of Les Mis. Um, the reason why I have two is well, the first one I thrifted on a whim, um, and I got the second book here, the one on the bottom, the bigger one. This is the Penguin Classics Deluxe Edition, and um, I got this because I'd heard praises about. This new translation, these are two different translations here. This is the new translation for Penguin Classics, and I'd heard so much about it, and so I haven't read, I haven't read Les Mis yet, but um, 
when I do, it's going to be the bottom one, and I'll have just the top one here for collection reasons, I guess. So we got 93 by Victor Hugo. Um, as far as I'm aware of, this book is out of print, like across the board, except for like independent publishers, I think. Um, this edition I had, I had to go to thrift books to get. Uh, this was printed in 1962, and there's an introduction there's an introduction by Ayn Rand. I have no idea why. I haven't read the book yet, but why is Ayn Rand on this thing? It bothers me. The Toilers of the Sea uh, by Victor Hugo. This was written when he was in exile. Pretty interesting. The Idiot by Dostoevsky. Notes from Underground by Dostoevsky. Um, it was hard reading the, the Underground. Notes from Underground because the Underground Man is... Uh, oh, man. He's a character. Okay. Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky. The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. We have Childhood, Boyhood, Youth by Leo Tolstoy. We have the big one here. We got War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. I finished this about a month and a half ago. Um, the f My first video on this channel is actually about uh, War and Peace. Uh, it's advice on, or tips I have on reading it. Um, I would recommend the video if you're if you want to read War and Peace. I think I gave some good tips. Anyway, uh, we have Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. How much land does a man need? And other stories by Leo Tolstoy. We have Master and Man and other stories by Leo Tolstoy. Uh, we have the Kritzer Sonata and other stories by Leo Tolstoy. Fathers and Sons by Ivan Turgenev. I have. Eugene Wunjin by Alexander Pushkin. Um, I believe he's called the Russian Shakespeare. Haven't read this book yet, but uh, very excited. I get very intimidated by, uh, you know, epic poems and, you know, things written in verse. Um, not exactly a literary format I'm comfortable with yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Um, if I were to recommend one book to get you into the classics, I'd probably recommend this. Uh, you know, this this book just it has it all. Revenge, Deceit, uh, Buried Treasure, uh, you know, Scoundrels. Uh, it's just like, it's just one of the greatest adventure stories ever written. Greatest, greatest revenge story ever written. I mean... Can't recommend this enough. I know this is a big book, very daunting. This is an unabridged translation of the French classic, but uh, there are abridged versions out there that are half the size that still tell, you know, the story in its depth. Um, the reason why the unabridged is 600 pages longer than the the uh, the abridged version is because uh, this was originally serialized in London in in France, and so you know it's published you know weekly or monthly in the newspaper so writers at the time had a financial incentive to extend things out but this book is amazing through and through even though it's super long it's just incredible the three musketeers by alexandre dumas the black tulip by alexandre dumas we have weathering heights by emily bronte sense and sensibility by jane austen we have middle march by george Eliot. Uh, let's go a few hundred years back, sorry. Uh, the selected essays of Michel de Montaigne. Montaigne. Um, I'm still getting the pronunciation down. Uh, absolutely fascinated with Montaigne. Um, his, I think his original essay is like uh, unabridged in full is like 1,400 pages. Um, but I hope to make a video on Montaigne one day. War Number 6 and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Um, I don't think it's Chekhov. I think it's Chekhov. I think I'm pronouncing that right. So hopefully that's the one pronunciation I get correctly. We have The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy by Jacob Burkhart. I picked this book up because I read Leon the Leonardo da Vinci biography by Walter Isaacson earlier this year, and I loved it. And getting wrapped up in Florence in the fourth you know, 1400s, 1500s, just that time period of, you know, of the Renaissance. It's just incredible to read about. It was just this hubbub of, you know, progressive ideals and, you know, these incredible paintings and sculptures. I mean, it was just, you know, 
just all the art that came out of it just it just it's such such a joy to read about and so that's what this book is about just the the forces that sort of caused the renaissance and analyzing what was going on during the renaissance in italy and uh haven't finished it yet but i i would still recommend it selected short stories by mal passant the story that inspired helped inspire moby dick the loss of the ship essex sunk by a whale the first-hand accounts um this is basically what herman melville read before he had the you know the idea of moby dick completed in his head i guess here we have moby dick um i finished this a few weeks ago this is my favorite book i've ever read um no i'm not, I'm not kidding I'm, i know there's a lot of uh you know there's a lot of memes about this book because it's like it's just herman melville like half the time he's just talking about whale facts and uh facts about ships um and you know i guess so you know those are valid criticisms but i those are so, like those chapters on the whale facts and everything were some of my favorite chapters i plan on making a video on this soon um but moby dick is like my, my favorite book up here um not my favorite edition obviously there's a lot more rare books on here but this is my favorite you know uh work of fiction narrative the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, Nantucket by Edgar Allan Poe. We have The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. We have Little Women by Louise May Alcott. Narrative of the life of ne Frederick Douglass and incidents in the life of a slave girl. We have Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Um, this copy is from the Franklin Library, so it's very nice, but the title's only on the spine. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Currently halfway through this right now. We have Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. We have the basic writings of Nietzsche. There's The Birth of Tragedy, which I have read. There's Beyond Good and Evil. Haven't read that. Um, 75 Aphorisms and The Case of Wagner, as, as well as a few other uh, works by, by Nietzsche. We have The Octopus by Frank Norris. This is published in 1901. Um, two reasons why I got this. One, out of print. Uh, by Penguin Classics, so, uh, you know, you don't see copies like this anymore. Um, so that's why I, I had to have one for my collection. Two, it re the story of it reminded me of the movie Chinatown, um, the 1974 book, or 1974 movie with Jack Nicholson and, um, oh my God, I forgot her name. I always forget her name. I don't know why, um, which, is, which is a movie I love. And so this book, reminded me of that and it's about the expansion of the railroad in the late 1800s in california and the conflicts with the railroad companies and the farmers and so that's why i picked up this book we have the gods will have blood uh by anatoly Fran france france not exactly sure what the pronunciation is um the the cover is a very famous painting it's the death of marat um and so this is about the reign of terror in France. The Trial by Kafka. A little bit unnerving, that, that, that cover. A Portrait of the Artist's Young Man and Dubliners by James Joyce. We have Ulysses by James Joyce. Boy, am I intimidated by this book. Uh, I have not made my first attempt yet. And I say a first attempt because I know I'm not going to be able to, you know, get this on my first try. But um, this is on my literary bucket list. One day I'll get it done, but uh, I don't know if it's happening anytime soon. We'll see. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham. Uh, I know how the title sounds, if you are unfamiliar with the author of the book, um, but the story is about a, an, an orphan boy, you know, going from, you know, childhood to, you know, manhood, I guess you could say, and the, the transition and the trials and tribulations that he has. And this is really up there with Moby Dick for me as like one of my favorite books ever. Um, it really helped me deal with some things that were going on in my life that, at the time that I read it. It just came into my life at the perfect moment. So I felt like destiny basically because it was like I was reading the pages and it was just like, oh man, like it just, it really spoke to me. And so um, I'm forever indebted to this book essentially. Uh, we have the collective stories of w somerset Maugham. um probably he's probably my favorite writer to be honest or one of my favorite writers but he's, he's definitely up there 
We have Heart of Darkness and select, Selected Short Fiction by Joseph Conrad. We have Dr. Zhivago by Boris Pasternak. We have The Third Man and the Fallen Idol. Um, haven't quite read this one yet. Um, very short. I, don't, I cannot imagine it taking very much time. But The Third Man is one of my favorite movies. The 1949 Carol Reed film with Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton. Um, love, love, love that film. So very excited to read the book. Here we have East of Eden by John Steinbeck. We have The Moon is Down by John Steinbeck. Uh, the Collected Stories of F. F Scott Fitzgerald. Um, I believe it has all of Flappers and Philosophers and Tales of the Jazz Age in here. So, And I got this for like four bucks on Thrift Books, so it was quite the steal. Uh, the Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is one of my favorite books. Really love this one. The final paragraph, final sentence is like, burned into my brain. I can still see it right now. Um, and uh, definitely a book I plan on rereading in the future. So earlier I talked about books, high school, not liking them. Well, on that topic, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. I, I actually, I read it and I finished it yesterday. It didn't start yesterday, but I finished it yesterday. Um, and I had to read this for high school and I spark noted it and retained none of it so coming back to it and rereading it i guess you could say rereading it not really rereading it but reading it for the first time basically in full um you know i understand why this is taught you know uh in the school curriculum it's a, it's it, it's kind of just you know a simple story but com so many layers to it and um it's just phenomenal you know another hot take shakespeare's a good writer you know, Great Gatsby is a good book. Anyway, so we got uh, A Movable Feast by Ernest Hemingway. Finished this recently. You can probably expect a video on this coming soon. Um, yeah. We have A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls by Hemingway. And there he is. There's the man. Uh, the, Master Mar the Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. Um... One of my favorite books, and if I were to try, if I had to like, you know, had to convince someone to read this book, uh, I would tell them that in this book, a talking cat wielding a shotgun gets into a shootout with a SWAT team, basically. Um, if that doesn't say on the book, then I can't help you. Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Pynchon? Not exactly... I don't know the exact pronunciation, but, uh, you know, this and Ulysses and Infinite Jest, uh, you know, the, tr the trifecta of impenetrable, impenetrable books. Um, I will be reading this hopefully this year. If I have the courage, it's going to take me a long time. It's probably going to take me like five to ten pages a day, just taking it in slowly. Um, but uh, intimidated, but... Very curious to read this and see what all the, the hype is about. So hopefully I read it and make a video on it later this year. Uh, we have On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Uh, the Plague by Albert Camus. We have The Stranger and the Fall by Albert Camus. The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. Uh, Two Years Before the Mass by Richard Henry Donna Jr. We have Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. And then basically to cap it all off, we have... The uh, a collection of French poetry, eighteen twenty to nineteen fifty. This is under the uh, under Penguin Classics, so I guess you can call it a classic. Um, and so that basically wraps up my bookshelf. Um, so let me know what you think of the video. Uh, let me know if any of these books pique your interest. If you want me to, you know, t you know, make a specific video on any one of these books, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to do it. Um, let me know if I convinced you about, you know, trying any new classics or uh, harboring the idea of maybe picking up a classic the next time you're in a bookstore. Because um, that was the real intent of this video is I just wanted to just show my enthusiasm for, uh, you know, classic literature of any culture or any nation, any time period. Um, you know, I, it just gets me so excited. And I, all I want to do is I want to share that enthusiasm. Um, with all of you.
And so, you know, hopefully I was successful in my mission and I would love to hear your feedback. And um, if you think there's any books on this shelf that are missing that I should add, let me know in the comments. Uh, if you just want to say hi, just say hi. You know, just let me know. Uh, in the you know in the comments down below. So uh, thank you for watching the video. Uh, I appreciate you, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Hopefully, subscribe. Make sure to subscribe because I have more videos coming. And uh, have a good day, and I'll talk to you later.